Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Atlas of the SARS-CoV-2 Proteome. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labbert, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labbert and sponsored by Ceno Biological. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their website at cenobiological.com. Now, let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Yuning Chen, R&D Manager at Sino Biological. For a complete biography on our presenter, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Chen, you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you for the organizer for the introduction. And uh, now let's jump right in uh, with the presentation. So today I'm going to talk about um, the work that we have been doing for the, uh, for the past uh, couple months uh, regarding uh, to create the recombinant protein and antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 to help us uh, combat this global pandemic. So before we uh, get into the contents of the talk, I would like to uh, give a quick shout out about Sinobiological, so we, I think we are in the industry known as the recombinant protein company. Uh, so we, have, we are, have extensive experience uh, regarding recombinant protein and recombinant antibody expressions, as well as the antibody discoveries. And uh, uh, our uh, portfolio comes in both products from um, genes to all the way to ELISA, ELISA kits as well as CRO services, which allows us to help our client with their process from drug discovery to drug screening and also to all the way to production and to characterization. And uh, so now uh, we have that out of the way. Um, so the content of the talk is divided into uh, basically four topics. So firstly, we're going to give a quick review of the current situation. And then I'm going to talk about um, the work that we have been doing to essentially recreate the SARS-CoV-2 protein library um, in vitro. And I'm going to do quickly, and the, I'm going to also quickly introduce you to the VITMAP system, which is a high throughput antibody and protein expression system. And lastly, last but not least, of course, is summary and acknowledgement. So um, the current situation that we're in, so we're in the, uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which it has caused um, uh, over uh, 740,000 deaths and with like over 20 million confirmed cases all over the world. So this is a dire situation. And the culprit for this uh, pandemic is the SARS-CoV-2 virus as indicated in this uh, electron micro, um, microscope image here. But of course, um, it's an RNA virus, but there is of course more than meets the eye. So the, um, the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is comprised of a single stranded RNA and it encodes about, uh, it can be divided into 10 open reading frames and it encodes about 25 proteins. Um, the proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 can be categorized based on their function as structural proteins, which include nucleocapsid, membrane, envelope, and the spike protein, which, is the, uh, inter which interacts with the host ACE2 receptor and is the, basically the entry point of the virus. And of course, there's non-structural proteins, which, are, uh, which include enzymes, uh, that, catal uh, uh, that catalyze the uh, crucial biological functions to ensure the survival and propagation of the virus. And of course, there are some access a lot of accessory proteins that are involved uh, to facilitate the enzymes to carry out their biological functions. So the proteins, no matter uh, the non-structural or the structural components of the virus, are important targets uh, for both diagnostic and uh, uh, therapeutic agent development purposes. Um, 
So again, so they're basically very good candidate for drug discovery. And uh, I think based on the scope of the current uh, medicine, uh, we can divide the, the, the drugs into two categories, both basically the biologics, biologics and small molecules. So biologics are the uh, basically antibody and antibody derivatives that can be uh, generated using different methods. And they basically target uh, the spike protein and they either in, uh, disrupt the spike interaction with the host ACE2 or they just flag the, the virus for the uh, immune system to, um, uh, uh, to clear the virus out of the system. And of course, there are small, uh, small molecules uh, that can be generated either by uh, compound screening or structure-based design. And I think with the development of artificial intelligence, um, this can also be a method uh, to facilitate the drug discovery process. So basically we obtain um, the structure of an enzyme uh, for the, for instance, for the SARS-CoV-2 and based on the structure, um, um, we perform, a, uh, you know, scientists perform a rational design and, uh, or they uh, perform a rational design or screening against uh, either compound libraries or, uh, uh, start from a compound template uh, to discover small molecules that can be used to neutralize the functionalities of these uh, of these enzymes. Um, so as you can see in this regard, the high quality recombinant proteins, um, recombinant virus proteins are important starting materials uh, for the drug discovery process. And of course, the proteins are also important for uh, development of diagnostic tools, especially uh, for, uh, for the ser serological tests of the viruses. And now, of course, the COVID-19 can be tested using molecular tests, which is accurate, but, you know, takes a while to, uh, to, takes a while to develop and to get the results. And uh, so there's, I think there's an urgent need for uh, very, uh, for reliable serological uh, tests. Uh, I think the comb combination of the two test formats can uh, really help us uh, get control of the situation. So to develop the serological test, we, were, would, we would also require you know, high quality uh, protein material and antibody material um, from, uh, 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 derived from the, from the SARS-CoV-2. So of course, the ser serological diagnostics of the virus comes in you know, different shapes and forms. Um, they, of course, they have their, you know, pros and cons in terms of uh, the availability, uh, also the time for, uh, also the time for development, and, and last but not least, of course, is the sensitivity. But, you know, no matter which format of the test that we would like to develop, I think the, uh, a prerequisite of uh, obtaining a high sensitivity and high specific specificity tests serological tests for COVID-19 is, the, um, is, is based on uh, the, the good quality starting material, which are the, uh, um, the recombinant proteins, as well as, um, anti as well as antibodies. So um, there are several targets on the virus that are very good for uh, you know, serological test development. The first one is its nucleocapsid protein. And interestingly, the nucleocapsid protein of the SARS-CoV-2 is actually highly, uh, we're relatively highly conserved with that of the, of, of the SARS virus, SARS-CoV virus, which was, which emerged in the, in the two, early 2000, 2003, I believe. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, ba uh, and uh, you know, based on the similarities, we, we can develop a, we can uh, use the uh, SARS antibody essentially to, de to detect SARS-CoV-2 as in the in, in example shown here. Um, this antibody, which is a rabbit monoclonal antibody from our company, uh, can recognize both uh, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS viruses, but has relatively very little um, cross-reactivity against other coronavirus, coronaviruses. And also the spike protein is also another very good target for um, antibody development. And because for one thing, it has a, a very uh, wide distribution of linear B cell epitopes, which enables the body to generate sufficient uh, immune response against this protein. Uh, 
and the antibodies derived from the spike protein can either be used as detecting antibodies uh, in serological de uh, test development, or uh, we can obtain like neutralizing antibodies for um, therapeutics applications. And here is an example um, showing several uh, neutralizing antibodies that has been uh, discovered during the uh, process uh, from the literature during the uh, uh, past few months, which demonstrates um, the notion that the spike protein is a, a inevitably a hot target uh, for, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So as I mentioned earlier, recombinant proteins are very useful, powerful tools um, for both drug discovery and the serological assay development. So that's our, uh, so that is um, the reason why we have devoted uh, most of our, a majority of our efforts during the past few months um, to uh, develop these proteins as the recombinant protein format and to essentially reconstitute a SARS-CoV-2 protein library um, uh, using our platforms. So basically to give a quick recap of the technique of protein, uh, recombinant protein expression. Uh, so basically we use a, tar uh, we have a target gene and we, um, uh, we uh, introduce the gene into a host cell uh, with a vector, and the host cell can then, uh, and then it can trigger the, you know, the host cell uh, protein production machinery uh, to overexpress the, the the protein of interest. So, and we can uh, obtain the proteins through purification methods. So at Sino Biological, we mainly use these three platforms for um, a recombinant protein expression. And I think during this, um, during the uh, times of the pandemic, it is uh, very, uh, the, the speed is the key. So it's very important that we um, develop the virus proteins quickly. Um, so, and then we are, ju we just have the, I think we just have the capacity to do that. Uh, I think we uh, previously would take us only a very short period of time uh, in, couple, uh, in, in, the, in the range of two weeks to develop proteins against uh, and influenza and Zika viruses. And, and this time, I think we, uh, we are the first company to uh, publicly uh, uh, to, to produce this uh, recombinant SARS RBD, uh, COVID-2 spike RBDs uh, in, just 12, uh, in just 12 days upon the publication of this sequence. And because of this, um, you know, a robust platform that we have established, um, we have also, um, created you know vir uh, virus proteins from uh, different viruses and uh, so this, this uh, so here is a um, link to the uh, viral antigen bank we call the provi um, so this is a good collection of reagents um, for you know virus research we have uh, over 800 proteins available and we also have elisa kits and uh, uh, antibodies against a, a, a over like 350 a string of different viruses. So, um, so this is a good collection of tools. And if you're interested, uh, you can find more uh, on this web, web page. So the challenges for the COVID-19 uh, antigen development or for any other uh, virus protein development is, <clears throat> so firstly, of course, uh, the speed is, as I mentioned earlier, speed is the key. So um, we would choose uh, systems that can um, both preserve the biological function uh, uh, functionalities of the protein and obtain the protein during a relatively shorter period of time. So in this case, the HEC-293 and E. coli uh, might be prioritized, but we can also use the insect cell as a backup plan. And uh, uh, in terms of culture methods, the stable cell line development could take uh, for the HEC-293 or uh, the CHO cell lines can take a month to establish. Uh, but the transient transfection methods will allow us the obtaining of um, a recombinant protein in a relatively fast fashion. So that's the, so this is the go-to method uh, that we use for, for this in Denver as well. So, and of course, the quality of the protein should not be compromised. Um, the, uh, the, I think the quality is re reflected in two regards. First is the, uh, we should produce protein with uh, relevant biological activities. Uh, which means that so so we should you know uh, we we should pay attention to the post translational modifications, 
And uh, of course, if there is any uh, you know cleavage of the protein by uh, certain enzymes that and to to put them into like two subunits, like the case of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike or the influenza HA virus uh, HA proteins. And if there are any like mutations we need to pay attention to, and uh, we can produce the protein in what kind of formats, like uh, um, basically the, the choices of uh, purific affinity tags are important as well uh, to, uh, to, eat, to make sure the tags do not interfere with the uh, biological in, uh, activity of the proteins. And of course, um, <clears throat> uh, we would also focus on, you know, which domains of a protein we would like to go uh, explore first. Um, so, uh, so the bio, so this, uh, so the biological reactivity will dictates the whole system and the design of the protein, and if any uh, engineering methods that we would apply, and also uh, to um, predetermine, you know, what kind of assay format that we would like to take. Of course, with that, we would also try to minimize batch to batch variations, which is um, actually a uh, actually a problem for you know these transient infection infection methods uh, the proteins you know comes in different uh, shapes and formats and they uh, with their uh, characteristics in the structure they could in potentially impose some uh, difficulties for us uh, they can prone they might be prone to aggregation and degradation and there might be you know activity um, fluctuations between batch to batch so this requires us to optimize the uh, transfection vector and the methods to introduce the gene into the cells and make the cells in a you know culture condition as stable as possible and of course last but not least to, do, um, to optimize the purification methods um, to minimize the damage of the protein during the uh, during the extraction process and lastly, of course, is the quantity because the proteins are used, you know, in dif uh, by different people at, at different scale, uh, and uh, they should be shipped maybe like all over the world. So uh, we would need, uh, so we would need to produce the protein at small scale. In this case, the you know the flasks, um, <clears throat> shaker flasks, or we can produce the protein at medi intermediate level using these um, mid-sized mid bioreactors. And we can also we also have like these gigantic uh, 500 liter and 1,000 liter bioreactors uh, for transient protein expression uh, as well to meet the demand of a uh, large quantity of the proteins. So um, with that and with all the with the established expression systems, we are gradually starting to map the uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteum essentially. Um, and so, uh, so here, as uh, as you can see, we have successfully produced uh, s several enzymes of the SARS-CoV-2, some non-structural proteins, uh, the of course, and of course the nuclear capsid and the spike protein. And the spike protein, we uh, make them into different um, sections. For instance, we have the full length, we have the S1, S2, the RBD, and we also, of course, have the uh, you know the RBD mutants. Uh, so the dark green colored proteins ha are, are the development of these proteins are completed and as uh, the, the little star here indicates, you know, these proteins are active in terms of um, in, in, in their in, in like enzymatic activity analysis. And of course, some of these proteins are still under development, but uh, we're confident they will be uh, um, um, out from the pipeline soon. And it, in the meantime, we also develop, you know, protein reagents for other coronaviruses. Um, <clears throat> so to, together with the, the with the ones from the SARS-CoV-2, and I think in collaboration of Nanomule, we have developed this uh, Sinomule, Sinomule uh, chip, which um, uh, is a, a chip for uh, detecting any format of uh, upper respiratory viral infections. Um, in, a, in a relatively high throughput format. So this is the, basically the current, so uh, this is the brief overview of the current progress. And uh, now I'm going to take us, um, a, a dive a little bit deeper into, um, in, into these uh, key components of the SARS-CoV-2. So first of all, of course, it's a spike. And uh, here shows the, uh, the, the S1 portion of the SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins uh, that we expressed using the transient 
uh, HEC293 um, expression system. So we make the protein bearing different tags, either his tag or FC tag, and the proteins showed good homogeneity um, and the purity. And of course, the protein is active and in its binding to the ACE2 receptor. And with the optimized uh, expression method, we can ensure the minimum batch to batch variations, uh, both in regard of their homogeneity, um, as here shown here by three um, by the data from three lots, and their uh, uh, binding affinity towards ACE2. Um, and you know, the, also shown here, uh, the, the 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 binding affinity varies only a little bit uh, between the between the three lots here. And the spike that the S1 protein has already been used um, in in an assay to determine the serum antibody from you know SARS-CoV-2 patient, uh, which shows um, which shows a very good uh, signal to noise ratio uh, when comparing to the um, to the serum from healthy donor. And I think since I think it was in February when this um, when the reports started to come in about the the mutations that has been discovered uh, in in the spike protein, and especially this um, this mutation D six fourteen G has raised a lot of eyebrows um, because of its dominance in the in the in you know in the virus strings and also in its um, potentially uh, increased. Uh, infectious, uh, you know, infectivity. So um, with that, we cre uh, we also generate the, the S1 portion of this, you know, quote unquote mutant. And this mu uh, this mutant has been produced in the HEC293 cell as well. And it also has very good purity um, and homogeneity over 95% as judged by um, the, uh, by the SCC uh, chromatography. And in terms of binding affinity towards the ACE2, uh, we tested these um, this characteristics using both the ELISA method as well as a BRI method. And the, the results um, that we discover is that this, mu this particular mutation did not alter uh, the binding affinity of the, the S1 of the SARS-CoV-2 to ACE2 uh, significantly, which is not surprised um, considering, you know, the location of this mutation uh, is slightly further off from the, the receptor binding domain, which carries, uh, mainly carries out the, uh, you know, ACE2 binding activity. Uh, but in terms of the infectious, um, you know, uh, the, the ability to infect host cells, uh, we did create a pseudovirus uh, based on this um, 614G mutant. And interestingly, we do ob um, ob uh, observe a significantly increased transduction fold change um, comparing to the, you know, quote unquote, wild type 614D uh, D variants. And in, in, of course, in our system. And this, is a, this trend actually agrees with the, the published record indicating that um, this, this mutation, this uh, D, uh, 614G mutation uh, did uh, did increase the infectious ability of, of this virus. And of course, um, besides the mut mutant in um, the uh, at the 614 position, um, there are various mutations been reported in in the RBD, the receptor binding domain as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we were the first company to produce RBD using a recombinant um, protein expression method. And this was used in the structural studies uh, to review its interaction with the ACE2. And with RBD, we were also able to generate a rapid uh, monoclonal antibody that shows very good um, virus specificity against COVID-2, but not <clears throat> does not interact with uh, the RB, uh, does not interact with RBD of other coronaviruses which is a good uh, reagent for a serological de uh, assay development. And of course, now we've started tracking the, the mutations that are um, indicated in the, uh, in the literature uh, um, that happens um, during this uh, uh, to, to the RBD region. So here are several examples of the, mut uh, of the mutant proteins that we've already produced. And we test, of course, we tested their binding affinity with the ACE2 using an ELISA type of form, uh, ELISA type of assay. 
and there are you know uh, ups and downs regarding to their binding affinity. Um, I would like to here. I would like to uh, focus on the uh, the V three sixty three sixty seven F mutation, um, which uh, which uh, the result the results published in the previous. Uh, publication indicates that it, it showed an increased binding affinity, which we also observed uh, in the ELISA format. And we contribute that um, increase of binding affinity towards the replacement of the valine side chain with the with the aromatic ring that could somehow stabilize the you know stabilize the region to make the um, to make this uh, interaction plane interaction plane more uh, exposed. And uh, there, uh, and uh, of course, there are reports indicating um, um, for the W four thirty six R mutant. Uh, the I think there were reported data indicating also exert some uh, increase in binding affinity. But here we only um, we we observed a slightly decrease the binding affinity uh, binding affinity towards ACE two. Uh, we and we I think we contribute that to its um, uh, to its stability, which which is indicated by its monomer uh, content in, in the in the preparation. So the protein itself is somehow uh, maybe uh, more uh, more unstable and prone to aggregate. So that could somehow uh, affect the binding affinity towards the ACE two. And I think with the library of the RBD mutants and the, the library is still expanding uh, at the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the time being, um, these mutants can be used for, you know, uh, to screening uh, either neutralize, neutralization antibodies or to help validate uh, serological assays to see if they're as, um, effect, uh, as effective against these mutants as against the you know the quote unquote wild type which is which is the published sequence. So here is just like a quick example. So we have discovered uh, we have generated a neutralizing antibody, um, which is a mouse monoclonal against the uh, against the RBD, and you can see as if we um, introduce this mutation into into the RBD region, uh, we do observe alteration in the in terms of a binding affinity. So the binding towards the while the the wild type is tighter um, comparing to that of the mutant so uh, in so this could be an indication that uh, some neutralizing antibody that the efficacy of some neutralizing antibodies or the sensitivity of some detecting antibodies could somehow be uh, compromised uh, with the presence of you know either one or a combination of a few mutants so I think this mutant library is so. This is why we created this mutant library um, to help with the <clears throat> to help with to ensure uh, the efficacy of the antibodies will be um, um, to, or or in an in an effort to screen a like broad spectrum antibodies that can um, recognize uh, that can have be as effective as the wild types and as the as the mutants. So um, here, I would like to uh, uh, quickly take a look at the you know the insect cells derived spike protein variants. So the um, we can use uh, we can the HEC two ninety three is uh, our uh, first go to choice because of its uh, relative uh, relatively fast speed in terms of uh, developing these proteins. But the insect cells are also very um, useful tools um, in this. Uh, uh, in 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 this event, uh, you can see they can produce the RBD and they can produce the S1 as well, and with very similar, uh, but with you know small molecular weight variations due to the extent of their glycosylation. But uh, they uh, the proteins proteins produced in both systems can interact at similar binding affinity uh, towards ACE2. And insect cells are useful. So for instance, for the uh, for the S2 portion of the COVID-2, we did have some difficulty to express this, uh, this uh, section using the, uh, the HEC-293 in the beginning. So, uh, but the insect, provide, the insect cell line provided us with a very good alternative um, to, produce, to produce this protein. So then we can add this to our, uh, uh, to our product collection. 
And here shows a uh, essentially optimization effort that we did to uh, stable to stabilize the this uh, the S two portion of this protein um, because it's like the trimer domain. So we're expecting it to form a you know trimeric form uh, trimeric format, but <clears throat> we would prefer um, you know we would uh, need to reduce the um, you know the the extent of aggregates. So we performed a uh, you know buffer optimization effort and which uh, significantly inc uh, reduces reduced the um, extent of uh, aggregations and this um, and the optimized uh, and the proteins in the optimized buffer showed a good um, stability and a recovery uh, after this uh, freeze and sawn ex uh, trial experiments um, which indicates that uh, this buffer is uh, at this point ideal for the storage of the uh, of the S2 protein, and we can also uh, make some engineering efforts to make proteins into um, into trimers or to somehow enhance the trimerization process of the proteins. So, one of such uh, approach that we Take is to add a photon to the to the C terminus of the of the fusion protein. So here we uh, <clears throat> here I showed an example. So we add a photon to a uh, to a wild type uh, virus protein, and we also added in the, in the same time we altered several amino acids in the photon domain uh, to make it lose its ability for trimerization. And you can see a very obvious shift in terms of the retention time on the SEC column. And because, of course, the photon is associated with, you know, themselves with um, non-COVID interactions, they can be disrupted by um, uh, reagents such as SDS. So we treat this wild, uh, this protein with the wild type photon with SDS, and uh, you, uh, you can observe the, somehow the association with the, uh, with the trimers and the, uh, the peak migrates more towards uh, the retention time of the <clears throat> of the monomer essentially so um the 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 enhancement of this trimerization is actually quite useful in terms of uh, you know improving the binding affinity of and improving the st stability and the binding affinity of the uh, of the sars um, uh, of the sars cov2 spike protein so here is an assay um, <clears throat> we construct a spike protein with a photon or without a photon, of course, and we uh, we observed a ten times increase in the binding uh, in the binding affinity towards ACE2, which indicates the the trimerization and the uh, stabilization of the uh, spike protein by photon is beneficial in terms of its uh, um, in terms of its activity. So such efforts has been uh, used uh, to produce influenza HA proteins, RSV glycoproteins, and of course, as shown here, is a spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And we are also trying this um, uh, photon trimer uh, on other uh, virus proteins as well. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a, I think it's a very uh, interesting and a very practical method to enhance protein trimerization. And of course, last but not least, I would like to uh, give a shout out to the E. coli expression system, which allowed us to um, express uh, nuclear capsid proteins. So during this optimization process, uh, we <clears throat> uh, optimize the temperature, the duration of the fermentation uh, to enhance the protein expression as soluble as you know as a soluble protein. And after purification and we do observe that the proteins are uh, the, the nuclear capsid proteins are present in a very stable oligomer, uh, oligomeric format, uh, which uh, can survive uh, like three times of freeze, freeze and sawn uh, cycles. And, with, and this uh, data actually agrees very well with the published record, it indicate the full length of the, the nuclear capsid should be presented in the format of a uh, a ligamer instead of a mon instead of a monomer, <clears throat> and we also um, in the preview uh, we also express the the nuclear capsid using uh, insect cell as insect system as well, and uh, 
and from the uh, and the, I think from the data you can see here that the protein expressed in E. coli shows a much better uh, profile in terms of its homogeneity uh, com when comparing to the counterpart that is expressed in uh, uh, in the insect cells. And of course, with a enhanced homogeneity, it also showed better, you know, binding affinity or specificity towards a um, nucleocapsid protein specific antibodies that we uh, generated. Now I would like to change the gear a little bit um, to talk about this beat map, uh, high throughput recombinant antibody production platform that we have established in order to uh, you know, facilitate um, high, screen, uh, high throughput antibody screenings, essentially. So basically what happens is that uh, we receive an antibody sequence library from a client and then we gener uh, generate a primer library corresponding to each, um, you know, each construct using a high throughput primer design and synthesized platform. And then we convert these primers into construction vectors. And of course, then transiently transfect the HEC293 cell culture array. And after the seven days of culture, we can um, uh, pur purify the antibody using one step purification. Um, which usually result in uh, over 90% purity. And then we send the antibodies back to the client for validation and uh, they can pick up a few um, to, uh, to scale up. So at this moment, uh, so the, the culture volume of this platform is set to be between 20 to 400 mil, which will allows us to obtain quantity between, uh, I would, I believe microgram to, to milligram scale. Um, you know, at this high throughput stage. And this, the weekly capacity uh, is to produce 100 to 200 antibodies. And so far we have um, completed, of course, like over 15 projects in, in this platform. And the, over, uh, and the uh, average success rate in terms of antibody expression is 85%. Um, <clears throat> so here is an example that uh, was a, um, a collaborative work that we have done uh, in er uh, earlier. And the, the clients has uh, uh, collected B cells from the COVID-19 patient, and then they uh, synthesize, they generate this amber antibody sequence library, and we produced uh, 632 antibodies using the bitmap. And the, the antibodies were uh, validated by purity analysis and ELISA to bind for this as either the S1 or the and both the S1 and the RBD of the, of the COVID-2. Uh, <clears throat> and the clients identified 14 neutralizing antibodies and we helped them with the scale up to 10, between 10 to 300 mix. And they used the antibody to for animal studies as well as structural analysis. Uh, the results was published, I think in Cell in early April. Um, and here is the reference if you're interested. So um, basically to, uh, to sum up, so virus proteins, they're crucial starting materials for uh, drug discoveries and uh, test development. And we have created a comprehensive protein library uh, for the source COVID-2 and other uh, coronaviruses. And I would like to also focus on the, the spike protein mutants. Um, so they can be, uh, they have, a, a mutant library has been created and uh, the, um, the, we, all, we do observe some alteration in their uh, binding affinity towards, uh, towards the ACE2 uh, receptor. And last but not least, um, this high throughput bitmap platform can ensure uh, efficient generation of both recombinant proteins and antibodies. And I hope it will be uh, useful for, um, your, uh, for your research um, either in uh, SARS-CoV-2 or in other um, areas as well. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, thank all the, uh, all the scientists and technicians that worked very hard to make, this, uh, to make these products available. And hopefully um, <clears throat> with the help of these recombinant proteins and antibodies, uh, we should steer clear of this pandemic uh, sooner. Okay, so with that, I would like to conclude this presentation.
Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the reagents we have developed for SARS-CoV-2, uh, please follow the links on this slide to, to find out more. And you can always contact us uh, via either phone or email. Uh, with that, thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how is Phenobiological involved in the race of developing a vaccine for COVID-19? Thank you. So <clears throat> um, I think it's safe to say that we're not uh, directly involved in the uh, developing of a vaccine, um, but we do provide um, the, the scientific community uh, with all the re uh, with a variety of reagents that are available to uh, uh, to, uh, to assay the uh, for the efficacy uh, of of the vaccine. So uh, we're uh, essentially playing a role of a helper uh, uh, rather than a direct competitor in, 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 in this race for the, for the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, what are the challenges in expressing the spike protein and any suggestions on how to improve spike protein stability? Well, I think spike protein is intrinsically very difficult to work with because it, it is, uh, so first of all, it's a very, very flexible protein. It, can pull, it, it has, um, I would say it, it can be divided into three major portions, the, the, S1 ver uh, the S1 region, S2 region, as well as anything that is associated with the membrane. So that alone gives us, give us a, a lot of complexity complexity to work uh, to begin with and also this protein is heavily uh, modulated uh, after uh, after you know post translationally uh, it's hev heavily glycosylated and in order for the spike to work it has to be processed by two enzymes the the ace2 and, and another enzyme that is associated with its uh, cleavage so <clears throat> Uh, so with these, you know, en enzymatic processing site, it contributes to the instability, the endogenous instability of the protein. So, it, so basically, the recombinant protein expression is a race between um, the generation of a protein and the degradation of a protein. So the <clears throat> the instability uh, factors within the spike protein contributes greatly to its instability. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I think uh, even for the uh, for the paper that uh, reviewed the firstly review the structure of the spike protein, um, they used a version called the uh, uh, called the prefusion, where uh, they eliminated the furin cleavage site uh, for one thing, and also they uh, uh, introduced the several mutations to the S two S two region of the protein to make it more stable. Um, so I think uh, in terms of to, uh, so I think that's a reflection of how uh, difficult it is to um, uh, to make these uh, to make this protein. And I think uh, with, with the time uh, uh, with, when the time goes on, uh, I think there are more and more uh, versions of the spike has been produced. Um, and then recently there was a publication uh, that, that reported a uh, uh, more stable version of the protein. Uh, uh, Called Hexapro, which they introduced the six proline residue, uh, six mutations on the S2 uh, region um, to change them into prolines to further stabilize the uh, stabilize the protein. So I think one um, a key method to improve the stability of the spike protein is to uh, introduce. I wouldn't say as many uh, mutations as possible, but uh, rationally, uh, so based on the structure of the protein, rationally design, uh, where uh, design what kind of mutations and uh, uh, how many mutated residues should be uh, introduced to the protein to uh, to one uh, to for one thing improve its uh, uh, to prove its stability, and also in the meantime um, to monitor its activity in terms of. 
um, binding to the ACE2 receptor uh, to make sure that it's stable and in the meantime um, without sacrifice any uh, ACE2 binding activity. So there's not, you know, <clears throat> uh, too much we can do in the uh, protein expression and the purification per se, but uh, um, I think that this is a, the place where protein engineering and uh, uh, protein sequence analysis methods really, uh, really shine, and uh, I think they can provide us with more uh, tools to 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 um, to to solve this issue and to improve the uh, stability of the spike protein. Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Chen. So our next question is, how do you choose the most suitable system for SARS-CoV-2 protein expression? Um, so I think, as I mentioned briefly in the in the presentation itself, uh, the, so SARS-CoV-2 has a proteum of uh, maybe like 25 proteins, and uh, 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 besides the spike protein and and the nucleocapsid protein, you know, many of them are enzymes. Um, so I think the, the in order to cho choose the most the suitable system. So I think we can take a uh, look at this uh, question from two perspectives. So from a pure, uh, you know, research perspective, uh, we would uh, need uh, to choose a suitable system. We would uh, require it to produce the protein at a uh, at a good yield and at uh, uh, acceptable biological activity. Um, however, um, I think during this time, because the develop because the speed is key, uh, we you know to in order to uh, 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 develop uh, uh, serological analysis tools as fast as possible. So it would require us to choose the, um, to choose a, a system that could give us uh, you know something to begin with, and then we uh, and then based on that information we. Uh, uh, start to um, to optimize in in order to you know to increase the increase the yield and in, uh, and maybe to <clears throat> uh, optimize the the protein activity. Um, so, but <clears throat> but the general guideline is uh, so it's like time uh, it has it has something to do with the production time. So we would like to choose a system that can uh, give us the protein as fast as possible. Uh, but in the meantime, I think uh, um, the uh, the, the choice will also be, uh, you know, uh, to produce a protein that is uh, biologically uh, as biologically relevant as possible. So for this, so for instance, for the spike protein, um, the <clears throat> the first line of choices will be the HEC293 and the insect because they can uh, add as much uh, post-translational modifications as possible um to the protein which you know these factors are indeed very important for the you know the biological function of the protein uh but for the enzymes of the <clears throat> of the of the SARS-CoV-2 um i think we're more uh concerned or we're more care about their functionalities and uh, <clears throat> i think a, a prokaryote system uh, in our case the e coli system will be uh, more than enough to uh, produce these pro uh, to produce the active form of these proteins for us. Um, so I think that um, so we went for uh, for for the E. coli first, but uh, the uh, eukaryote system, for for instance, insect cells can also give us some you know alternatives just in case uh, if the uh, the E. coli fail to uh, Express the protein, or it fails to produce uh, an active form of the protein. Uh, so basically, we would need a uh, a first line of choice. So uh, either HEC293 or the, or the insect. Uh, oh, sorry, or, or the E. coli for you know different proteins. And we also uh, would have a like essentially like a backup plan. In this case, and in our case, is the insect system. So um, yeah, so so with that, I think it's a comprehensive uh, chosen of hosts to um, uh, yeah to to express the the, the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Thank you. Now, what is the intended use of the RBD mutants, and in what format are they supplied? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think. Uh, the first reported RBD mut uh, mutants were um, appeared in literature 
actually very early during this pandemic, I think somewhere in March. Uh, so that's where we started to, you know, pay attention to these mutants because uh, uh, they can uh, they can either be benign and you know didn't do anything, or they can uh, alter the um, uh, alter either the binding to the ACE2 or the you know essentially the virulence uh, of the virus. And I think, uh, you know, with the progression of the time, there are many studies in, <clears throat> um, also pay attention to the, uh, you know, to these RBD mutants, and uh, uh, they use like pseudovirus analysis to um, to somehow study these mutants. And uh, they do, uh, there are indication that with certain mutations, uh, the virus could be more infectious, and uh, it could also uh, maybe invade. Uh, uh, the you know the neutralizing neutralizing antibodies that has been generated by uh, you know by patients or uh, by other method, uh, by other laboratory methods. So I think that's why we uh, um, we're quite uh, focused on the uh, where we devoted a lot of energy to produce a library of these uh, you know RBD mutants. I think they're important for uh, either for both you know the, the the, uh, the serological assays to validate, you know, if this assay is as sensitive as um, to the to the uh, quote unquote wild type versus, you know, these these mutants. And also, I think it could, um, uh, if if you have a, like a therapeutic antibody, um, uh, I think people would be also interested in to see if the therapeutic antibody is going to be as effective. You know, against these mutants as the as the quote unquote the wild type uh, wild type strain, and I think a, a fast method to you know study uh, to to uh, to investigate the you know the efficacy of the antibody against the mutants would be to screen it as, you know for the binding to these mutants uh, uh, instead of uh, you know using a pseudoviral assay. You know, of course the the virus assay has has its merits, but uh, it would take some, you know, time to develop, uh, but you know, with the proteins available, you can, you know, directly do the screening, which will, um, you know, say, uh, give indications uh, of the efficacy of the antibody and also um, saves the developer some time, I think. And the RBD mutants are format, uh, so they they're supplied in, you know, individual formats, of course. So you can order, you know, one mutant, uh, the, you know, the mutant of your interest. And I think we're also uh, trying to make them into a into like a semi uh, high throughput screening format, so to put them into uh, onto a plate, so that you can um, you know screen multiple mutants at a time, so uh, to essentially to speed up the uh, the the R and D process for uh, you know anti um, uh, SARS CoV two antibody development. Right. So just to remind our audience, uh, we do only have time for a few more questions. So just as a reminder, the, any questions that we don't are unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be answered by Dr. Chen via the email address that you provided at the time of registration. So we'll move on to our next one, which is, can I use fold-on in my prokaryote expression system? Uh, this is a uh, uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, so I think the short answer is yes. So I've read uh, some literature. Um, they uh, use the photon in the in the E. coli to produce a stable trimer a format of a protein. Uh, but I would like to or, you know urge our listeners and or you know the researchers to to pay attention. Uh, so. Um, even though photon can do, um, you know, a lot of things, uh, in our case, can make tri uh, trimers for uh, for the virus proteins, but uh, we would need to consider the, you know, the the protein itself before we proceed to add uh, uh, this trimerization domain or any other, uh, you know, oligomerization domains um, uh, to the protein because once uh, because it's, we're essentially forcing. Uh, the proteins together to form a, a higher degree of, uh, I wouldn't say aggregates, but form a higher degree of association with themselves. So if the protein itself, if there are some, you know, instability issue, uh, instability regions reside within the protein itself, it could call, it could be problematic um, in in their production. So I think, uh, so I think yes, you can use a photon in the prokaryote system. 
uh, but you, uh, I, but I think it would be um, sensible to um, take a very careful look at the protein sequence uh, to um, to to you know anticipate any uh, problems that might associate it uh, with the you know association of the of as association or the trimerization of the target proteins. It looks like we have time for one more question. So, Dr. Chen, what is the advantage of the VITEMAB system? And have you created a recombinant protein library using this platform? Uh, yeah, so the, the VITMAP system uh, is basically a der derivative of our, uh, you know, HEC-293 protein expression pipeline. Uh, so I think the advantage of the, the I think the most, uh, the biggest advantage of this VITMAP system is that um, <clears throat> With the information, uh, so we t uh, so with the information from the system, we can directly assess the scale ability of an antibody. So you know, some antibodies can be produced at a high level, and uh, other antibodies, uh, uh, you know, the the expression level varies based on the antibody sequence. Um, but with the VITMAP, we can so first we can sc uh, we can screen we can literally express like hundreds of antibodies. Uh, in a short period of time, like in a week or two, um, to help create the the library the, with a with a decent size for you know for the client to to screen, and the the information about the antibody uh, expression level would allow us to um, you know to uh, from another perspective to to select you know the the candidates that are uh, that are essentially most uh, um, most, could uh, add uh, that they're essentially be more, you know, successful in terms of a uh, high-level expression. Um, so, so with these, uh, you know, with the with the two, I think it will be it will provide the client with a uh, relatively clear picture of, uh, you know, which candidates they would like to uh, select and to move on to, you know, scale up production. And also the the I think the inform uh, the 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 yield bit from the uh, I think the small scale production could be directly translated into the into the yield from the, from the scale up. So uh, so based on the information of the of the pilots of the small scale, uh, we would know how much protein or antibody we would be able to get. Um, so that could I think also provide as uh, could also be you know advantageous uh, in terms of the scale up production of any uh, given antibodies. And uh, for uh, for the protein lab, uh, so we also so we do have uh, tried a few times uh, using the VITMAP system to create a recombinant protein library. And I think the uh, the most recent event would be uh, we collaborated with uh, distributed bio and uh, we created a uh, library, uh, two libraries for them actually uh, for uh, 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 for some uh, influenza. Uh, HA and NA proteins, uh, but uh, I think the uh, the, the recombinant pr protein library is a little bit trickier um, than the antibody library because you know proteins are more versatile. Um, so we anticipate you know more problems in terms of their um, in terms of uh, of their productivity in, in this system. But uh, uh, but I think at the end of the day. Um, uh, it, it's still it's still proven to be a very useful system, and uh, uh, we delivered over I think over 85% of of the of the target proteins in in these two libraries. Thank you again, Dr. Chen. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, yeah, so uh, I would like to you know take this opportunity to thank the organizers. And of course, you know this pandemic is far from over. So um, uh, please wear a mask and uh, you know keep social distancing and uh, you know stay safe. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by Dr. Chen via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Dr. Chen for his time today and for his important research. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, Genobiological, for underwriting today's educational webcast. 
You can view the webinar on demand. Labrys will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.